well, I'm, I'm Li Xin, your ho uh, host for this panel today. I'm really excited to be here because this is a panel that has been long overdue. It's meant for the ALA conference in May in San Diego, and everyone was very excited. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the San Diego conference uh, was canceled this year due to the COVID-19 situation. So uh, I'm so glad that we could eventually talk about disasters and dimensions together. <laughs> Again, facing one of the biggest uh, disaster so far in human history. Um, well, I, I, I'm i sorry to sound that cheerful, it shouldn't be, but um, I feel like part particip the experience of participating in this uh, online conference sort of keeps my hope up. And uh, I will be looking forward to uh, listening to all the uh, fantastic uh, papers. I will give uh, each speaker a brief introduction and then we will move on to each individual presentation and then we'll save um, around 20, 10, 20 minutes at the end of the panel for a discussion. Um, I hope that th this kind of arrangement is okay with you. And uh, I'm sorry that your, your papers are all so sophisticated and well thought out and you only got five minutes. So it's gonna be very condensed, but I'm sure um, more questions will be uh, asked uh, during the discussion. I would also like to share a, um, a paper by one of the speakers, Linda Freeman, who, unfortunately had to drop out in the middle um, well like uh, of her family um, uh, business so um, she wanted me to share her paper the links to her paper I will paste it in the chat box later okay because I couldn't really I couldn't find a file at this moment uh, but I'll put it there and then feel free to have a look if you are interested then um, I would like to begin the session by introducing our first speaker Amanda Lowe she's currently a PhD student in Columbia Department of English and Comparative Literature her intellectual interest include the geological theories of a number of 19th century American intellectuals and their impact on literature and art. She also, uh, she's also interested in co-criticism, the history of colonialism and slavery, among many others. Amanda is current graduate student coordinator for the Freedom and Citizenship Program and will be an SOF Heyman Center Public Humanities Fellows for the 2000-2001 academic year. So very exciting. Amanda's talk will be Nerve in Marble, Emotion, Disaster, and Geology in Dickinson. Welcome, Amanda. Great, thank you. Thanks, Li Shin, and thank you so much for coordinating this. Um, it's meant a lot to me to be able to have at least this sort of short, condensed version of a conference um, coming up this summer since I was very excited to participate in our ALA panel. So uh, thanks, EDIS, for, um, for offering to have us. Um, so the thinking um, in this presentation, I'm, I'm really excited to be here a, and then I'm going to do a slight screen share to um, to share. Um, I've dropped my brain with you so that we can look at it together. Um, but the thinking in this presentation really comes out of my research on the influence of Edward Hitchcock's elementary geology on Emily Dickinson's poetics. Um, in my work, I examine the presence of volcanoes and metamorphic rocks in Dickinson's poems, um, two ends of a geomorphic spectrum with volcanic eruptions um, involving hot flows of magma on the one end and metamorphosis involving the slow transformation of mineral content after long periods of applied force on the other. While we might rightly associate disaster um, with volcanic eruptions, the metamorphic rocks of Dickinson's poems are her emblems for disaster, signifying the dramatic changes wrought in the aftermath of destruction. The geologist Edward Hitchcock was a close family friend of the Dickinsons. Hitchcock worked intimately with Edward Dickinson at Amherst College, um, 
and became president of the college while Edward Dickinson was treasurer. However, beyond this family connection, um, Emily Dickinson studied Hitchcock's book, Elementary Geology, um, which was the first comprehensive American textbook on geology, uh, while attending Amherst Academy. Um, it was also on offering while she was at um, Mount Holyoke, but she was not she was technically not in the right grade level to be reading it. There were, uh, Mary Lyon had a lot of um, regulations about what she thought young women should be reading when. Um, and so I attribute her Dickinson's awareness of geology really to this, time, this earlier, younger time while she was at Amherst Academy. Um, Dickinson's intimate knowledge of Hitchcock's work is significant because her poetry demonstrates a depth and complexity of awareness about how geological systems were believed to work. This holds in particular with her allusions to metamorphic rocks across her career, as they are consistently associated with the same suite of emotional and physical states. That is, the rocks that appear in Dickinson's poetry uh, are not simply illusions, ones that might certainly demonstrate Dickinson's vast knowledge of kinds of rocks, but which might um, each stand alone as vehicles for discrete metaphors. Instead, they should be understood as a semiotic system deeply informed and shaped by Dickinson's understanding of the geology of her day. This is what I'm calling Dickinson's geologos, the logic of radical change fundamentally modeled on metamorphic theory. So metamorphic rocks are a genera of fused rock whose original mineral content has been entirely converted. Granite and marble, two of Dickinson's most used rock illusions, are both metamorphic. Theories of rock metamorphism developed significantly between the 1840s and the 1860s. But their major significance for Edward Hitchcock was that philosophically they stretched hum the human capacity to understand time because they took so long to make. He writes in the 1862 edition of Elementary Geology, men are, quote, men are accustomed to look upon the solid rocks as emblems of permanency. But in fact, science teaches us that they are in a constant state of flux. They may be permanent when measured by the life of an individual, but when we compare their condition in the different and vast geological periods, change is the most impressive lesson they teach. Humans live at a time scale much shorter than that of geological processes, but understanding metamorphism, while a particularly slow and unobservable process, gives humans a sense of the slow but significant pace with which rocks move and morph. Disaster in Dickinson proves to be equally revealing of the depth and length of history. However, Dickinson's allusions to rock metamorphosis demonstrate an understanding of the human body not as finite, but as unimaginably protracted. She finds the same plasticity within persons that Hitchcock finds within rocks. Um, in the sense that states of liveliness and deathliness can transition into one another in her poems and back. So here I'm gonna share, um, I'm just gonna share with you a document of, I've dropped my brain. Can everybody see this okay? Okay, great. Um, so I've dropped my brain, my soul is numb, begins in the wake of such a disaster. When Dickinson's speaker struggles to articulate her new state of being after an ambiguous, destructive event. She describes this new state through an extended analogy with metamorphic rock. We learn about this illusion only retrospectively, as Dickinson's speaker describes the state of her body. Um, this is in the first stanza. The veins, of, the veins that used to run stop palsied to paralysis done perfect her in stone. Vitality is carved and cool, my nerve in marble lies. What at first appears to be a simple analogy between veins and stone shows itself in the second stanza to be an extended allusion to metamorphic rock processes. Her veins that are like stone then show themselves to also behave like veins in marble, metamorphic material that while once plastic has congealed. Here, I've dropped my brain maps the human body onto geological formations in the poem and vice versa. 
And in analogizing the two bodies, flesh and stone, the speaker overlays them so that they become indistinguishable from one another. Like Hitchcock's claim in elementary geology, the poem recognizes that if one metamorphism is possible, another could be on the way, though, quote, centuries beyond. This is why I say that the poem's logic is primarily metamorphic. The speaker believes she is suspended in one state that could still yet become another. Dickinson writes in the poem's final stanza, let me scroll down. Um, I've still a chance to strain, this is starting here, to being somewhere motion breath those centuries beyond and every limited decade I'll shiver satisfied. This is the logic of the deep time of metamorphism, slow, imperceptible, but radical change coming perhaps centuries beyond. The poem's analogy to metamorphic rock opens both the logic and the form of the poem to new possibilities as to the revivification of a stone-like human body, extending the length of that person's history as well as their future. Disasters come slowly and imperceptibly for Dickinson, and recovering from them proves to be just as long a process. Dickinson's speaker in I've Dropped My Brain uses a cluster of concepts to create an extended analogy to rock metamorphosis that is subterranean. Not explicitly stated within the poem, but instead alluded to in her image choices. However, this analogy does not end in its representative or expressive function, but is indicative of Dickinson's geological thinking more broadly about her speakers and the disasters they face. As I aim to show, when Dickinson's speakers relate their bodies to metamorphic rock, they are not metaphors alone. In their extension through the poems, metamorphic rocks start to articulate principles shared between rocks and persons. Metamorphic processes shaped by heat and effective pressure. Her speakers seem to see a continuum between the human and the mineral, though the exact meeting point remains insensible to them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Amanda. That's such a beautiful reading of the poem. Um, I'm sure there will be more questions for you later. And now uh, let's move on to the second speaker. Um, Jamie Fatton. Uh, Jimmy Fenton is a doctoral candidate at the University of Cambridge, supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. His research is American Civil War poetry and how it listened to the sounds of the war as part of a broader interest in the intersection between lyric theory and sound studies. And he just did a research fellowship at the Library of Congress, Washington, D.C., uh, from January to May this year. Um, and his topic today is Dredge but the Whizzing, Emily Dickinson's Catastrophic Microhistories. Jamie, welcome. I am muted. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I was going to actually try and show the slideshow, but that's going to go wrong. I'll just do it in this kind of thumbnail view. Can everyone see the screen share? Great, super. Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you very much to the Society for having me. It's um, really lovely to be here um, and a shame that we couldn't meet in San Diego, but hopefully sometime in the future. So um, five minutes is not enough time to sketch any grand theories. So today I'm just going to talk about something very small indeed, um, bullets. In Fascicle 29, which has been dated to the second half of 1863, we find this poem. If any sink assured that this now standing failed like themselves, and conscious that it rose, grew by the fact and not the understanding how weakness passed or force arose. Tell that the worst is easy in a moment, dread but the whizzing before the ball. When the ball enters, enters silence. Dying annuls the power to kill. The first stanza is Dickinson at her most elliptical. While the lines are ostensibly in an alternating rhyme scheme, the rhymes are perfect, standing, standing, rose, rose, and so serve only to obscure. The winding statement has the tone of consolation, but a consolation from a place so far beyond that it has developed its own language, all but inaccessible to us. The second stanza seems to acknowledge the obscurity of the first and offers instead a miniature parable. Before diving into this parable, it's worth noting that this is perhaps an inverse of Dickinson's normal two stanza scheme, 
where a small noticing gives on to a more complicated rethinking. I haven't quite worked out how to reckon with that flip yet. We are told in the second stanza to dread but the whizzing before the ball. All at once, we are on a battlefield of the Civil War. After the circular overlapping language of the first stanza, the word whizzing stands out in its weird specificity. All I really have time to do now is to ask where that word whizzing comes from. To the extent that a Dickinson's poem is about anything, this poem is probably about Fraser Stearns, the son of the uh, president of Amherst College who was killed at the Battle of Newburn in 1862. The study of Dickinson and the Civil War practically revolves around Stern and Dickinson's response to his death. I believe that this sometimes overwhelms the discourse, but that this poem, if any sink, is a direct complex engagement with the event uh, in the way that some other apparent Fraser poems are not. Fraser's death is, was listed in an issue of the Springfield Republican, which would have arrived at the Dickinson household on March the 22nd, 1862. Further up, the very same column from the casualty list is a description of part of the proceedings of the Battle of Newburn. The paper describes a group of artillery struggling to load and fire as fast as possible for one hour and five minutes with grape and canister shot and rifle balls whizzing around and over them. Here then is one possible source for Dickinson's whizzing. But I believe she's even more closely acquainted with ballistics than this might suggest. In commanding us to dread but the whizzing before the ball, she seems to be showing her knowledge of the fact that Minier balls, uh, the new ammunition invented during the Civil War, um, when they were fired from the most common rifles, they traveled at subsonic speeds. So in almost every case, the sound of the bullet, its whizzing, imparted by the rifle barrel would reach you before the ball did. Fear dying in its, in its cacophony, Dickinson suggests, but not death in its silence. Part of the problem of studying Dickinson and the Civil War is the startling confidence of her ventriloquism. It seems a reflex almost automatic for Dickinson to write from the perspective of a soldier, crossing in an instant what has been called the insurmountable gap in experience between civilian and battlefield combatant. Critics have referred to this variously as uh, polyvocality, uh, heteroglossia, and dramatic lyric, but I believe all of these run the risk of talking over Dickinson's style and its capacity to take up new knowledge like that of rifle barrels and subsonic bullets in this example. This poem is not Fraser speaking. Dickinson does not do the soldiers in different voices to take from Dickens via Eliot. It is just Dickens writing, Dickinson writing, albeit with some new information to hand, which she assumes seamlessly into her style, the ultimate source of her startling ability to know. That's my five minutes, might have been slightly shorter, but there we go. Um, thank you very much. It's fantastic, Jamie. Uh, it's very short, but very powerful. Thank you. Um, now let's move on to the third presentation um, by Maria O'Malley. She is Associate Professor uh, of English at the University of Nebraska, Kearney. She's the co-editor of Beyond 1990, uh, uh, 1776, Globalizing the Centuries of American Revolution and the forthcoming monograph on early American women writers from S LSU Press. Her current project focuses on Emily Dickinson and memorization. Uh, her topic today is Emily Dickinson and the Politics of Time. Maria, welcome. There we go. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for organizing and rescheduling the, the panel. Okay. So much of what I'm about to say will fit in with our other speakers. Can everyone hear me? Okay. So the concept of the flaneur is often associated with Walt Whitman and his surveys of people and activities along city streets. Yet the terms that scholars use to describe the flaneur, such as the ephemeral, the fleeting, and the contingent, recall the poetry of Emily Dickinson, long associated with the city of Amherst and the homestead, it will seem odd to associate Dickinson with the flaneur. However, I seek to make the case that her verses animate the paradox of a grounded roving, not only as a way to shape a dynamic space, for writing poetry, but also as a means of encountering the alterity of the other. 
So I want to start, I want to look at the poem that many people probably already know, which is they shut me up in prose. So consider her use of the word still in the stands I'm about to read. This is from Fascicle 21. They shut me up in prose as when a little girl, they put me in a, the closet because they liked me still. She puts still in quotation marks as though quoting the adults. And then she repeats the word as though overhearing herself. She scoffs at it, the word still, before explaining how no one can still her mind. So stanza two reads, still, exclamation point, could themselves have peeped and seen my brain go round? They might as wise have lodged a bird for treason in the pound. The poem hinges on that word still as it moves through analogies, revealing a vertical or longitudinal roaming rather than horizontal movement. The way in which she remarks upon the discursive formation she set forth in stanza one indicates how she flaneurs through her own poem's use of language, not only here in this poem, but in her poems that comment upon themselves or that mount various analogies to describe the same phenomenon. Like the discussion yesterday when Suzanne and Jane were analyzing After Great Pain, Suzanne used a phrase and when she was looking at you know these mounting analogies she said there's a surplus of figurations. The Flaneur's relation to time and space are somewhat intertwined. As Anita Sipa explains, the city streets function as transitory stages of modern life. Yet the word stage implies stasis, and in contrast, there is no such stable or settled ground that appears in Dickinson. Instead, in many of her poems, the time and space seem in perpetual flux. So I want to talk about a poem that begins, I think to live may be a bliss, and I'm not sure how to share a screen to tell you the truth, so I'm not sure if I can if I can do that properly. And, uh, but maybe I'll just read the stanzas. <laughs> I think to live may be a bliss to those who dare to try beyond my limit to conceive, my lip to testify. Now the speaker notes the gap between the concept of bliss and the failures of the mind and the voice to speak about it because it is beyond my limit. That's the, a word that also appeared in the poem that Amanda looked at. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm kind of getting lost in Zoom right now. Did something switch? Um, are you, I think Jane is sharing. Jane, you have to stop sharing the screen. Uh, can you stop? Because uh, I lost my paper now. <laughs> can you, can you edit that out? <laughs> Um, yeah, can they, can they undo sorry, I, I will send him a text. Uh, Probably. Sorry, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, Jim, can you hear us? Uh, I will send him a text. Via the chat. I'm, I'm sending him a message via the chat. Oh, great, okay. Okay. No, okay, so now we're back a little bit. Thank you. Um, yeah, for some reason I'm having a little bit of computer problems here now. Okay, I think I'm back. Okay. Maria, um, there is a green button, uh, share screen, if you would like to use that, feel free to do that. I'm going to authorize you. There you go. Okay, well, it, maybe I can just, I don't want to take up more time like watching me use the computer in a brand <laughs> incorrectly. So I'll just, I'll, I'm almost done and I'll, I can maybe figure that out later. Uh, but the poem begins and it's pretty short, you know, she says, beyond my limit to conceive my lip to testify. And one of the things I, I wanted to just focus on there is that way in which it's beyond my limit, which sounds a, an interesting way to frame that kind of boundary. A lot of times we'd say beyond my ability to conceive, but yet already she's already behind the experience. So the poem itself, I think to live may be a bliss, surveys how the mind easily distorts what's seen and known, as in the fourth and fifth stanzas. The fourth stanza she has, but certainties of sun, midsummer in the mind, 
a steadfast south upon the soul, her polar time behind. And I want to focus on these abstractions that humans use to mark time and space, south, polar, midsummer. Um, the, the variant for midsummer in that particular stanza is meridian. Kind of how they fail to represent the orbiting Earth, but create this perceptual illusion that reinforces human domination of the Earth. In the next stanza, the speaker concedes how, and I'm quoting the last stanza here, the vision pondered long, so plausible becomes that I esteem the fiction real, the real fictitious seems. The very concept of pondered long seems to invite a misrecognition of one's condition because it's impossible to have any length of time to ponder something dynamic and it results in a chiasmus of confusion between the real and the fictitious. The whole image of certainties of sun in the end hinges on the hesitating verb seems. Ultimately, Dickinson speakers flaneur among hyper objects. And this concept would probably be you know, uh, rel uh, applicable to both the previous presentations. In his book, Ecological Thought, Timothy Morton coined the word hyper objects to describe material objects or processes whose time and spatial configurations are too large to comprehend. So Morton, this is from Morton, products such as styrofoam and plutonium that exist on almost unthinkable time scales like the strange stranger, these materials confound our limited, fixated, self-oriented frameworks, end quote. Certainly coronavirus or rock metamorphosis would also be hyperobjects. Later writing it, he wrote a whole book called Hyperobjects in 2015, Morton clarifies, quote, they involve profoundly different temporalities than the human scale ones we are used to. Dickinson's engagement with time and space constructs, though, is not an exercise in perception but a means of engaging with the other. Thank you so much for, for listening to me and allowing me to, to share these ideas with you. Thank you so much, Maria, that's very inspiring. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, Mohammed. Um, just to double check, is Mohammed here now? Um, if not, then we will move on to our final speaker. Jen Lenore Marimot Rodo. He's a graduate student from the University of California, Ir uh, Irvine. His research focuses on 20th and 21st century American poetry, queer theory, lyric theory, and queer archives. He's currently working on research projects such as Elizabeth Bishop's Travel Poetry, Regina Shepard's The Conception of a Queer Lyric, as well as the notion of a queer archive. And his topic today is the possibility of a queer lyric reading difficulty in Dickinson's poetics. Jane, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Again, it's an honor to be in, in the EDIS. This is my first like conference with this particular society. So it's kind of a trip to have it be in a virtual format, but I'm really appreciative of the work that's been done to make this possible. I really wish we were all in San Diego, but for many obvious reasons we're not. So since I only have five minutes, I'll get started with reading what I have. So what I offer today is a speculative dimension in reading Dickinson's poetry. When I say the words queer and lyric, each word individually manifests various ways of reading a, po of reading a Dickinson poem that can be in ways both discrete and interconnected. For this, present, for this presentation, I focus on what happens should we attempt to intermix those two terms together as a quote unquote queer lyric. This does not mean I am necessarily arguing that something like a queer lyric in Dickinson can exist as a stable, fungible concept. After all, queer and lyric, but both um, using both as discrete terms, they are prone to be taken for granted as stable literary concepts. It is easy to assume that a lyric is itself stable, but it is also just as possible, as Virginia Jackson stresses in Dickinson's Misery, to impose lyricness on poems where a lyric paradigm may not even be in consideration. So what I propose is the possibility and stress on the word possibility of a quote unquote career lyric. And I use the word possibility to acknowledge that a queer lyric as a literary concept is in itself unstable. So if we can succeed in reading that unstable concept in Dickinson's poetry, of course, we're going to find that 
difficulty in applying those terminologies. Because just as the word lyric could assume what we'd like it to assume, so too can the word queer. So the one poem that I'd like to dwell on today is Her Best is Fit for Pearls. And I read it as an example of how a Dickinson poem can elude a singular reading methodology, even when we present the text itself, song context, without its, mater without its material history. Reading the poem just itself, itself as a textual object, it's pretty easy to apply an intuitive model of a quote unquote, of a quote unquote queer lyric that can assume many things about the poem. When speaking about the poem as a lyric, it's easy to notate it with a clear notion that there is an addressee, even if we may not know who that addressee is. We know that there was a her that resonates throughout, that resonates throughout the brief poem. There was also an I that appears in the poem itself alongside its brief length and emotionally charged nature. So the rhetorical question I have in mind, how is it not a lyric poem? Which also leads me to another rhetorical question. How do we read the poem as queer? One can say that the model of a quote unquote lyric begins to destabilize before we even get to the poem itself. There is no shortage of scholarships that attempts to bridge those two words together, either directly or indirectly. If, if you're familiar with the works of say, Robert K. Martin, John Vincent, Michael Snedeker, the notion of queerness certainly haunts the backdrop of lyric discourse and criticism. Yet a queer lyric in the praxis that lyricism itself is queer mostly tends to find focus in Whitman, Crane, what have you. But Dickinson, surprisingly, tends to be a very elusive name in that critical moment that emerges in the 90s and the 2000s. So if we are to read queerness in this particular Dickinson poem, maybe we can try to find that by trying to speculate its contextualization. One could make the argument, try to argue that there are tinges of lesbian desire in the poem. A compelling case can be made for a discreetly queer reading if we try to not think of the poem as a lyric poem, but as a queer poem. If we hold stable that the poem's addressee is Sue, Susan Dickinson. This is where reading Dickinson's poetry, especially under the auspices of trying to force, of trying to sort of mold her poetics to fit either a theoretical mold or multiple theoretical molds presents challenges and snags. This is where difficulty comes in. There are multiple and very subtle resonances in which one can, in which one can fit her breast is fit for pearls. It could be a queer lyric or a lyric that happens to be queer or a lyric poem that happens to have queer elements. However, it is also just as valid to say that this poem may appear, may appear to resist those readings. Indeed, it can be possible to say that her breast is fit for pearls may not even be a lyric at all. However, those possibilities remain tantalizing. And I certainly do not say that reading the poem as a lyric poem or as a queer poem is inherently wrong. What this poem offers us is precisely the difficulty in reading a Dickinson poem in that regard. Perhaps the importance of a queer lyric that specifically emerges from Dickinson and one that differentiates from a queer lyric that we may try to read from Whitman is precisely that Dickinson teases us with that emergent possibility. So when we try to reckon with this material history, especially when we look at its fascicle and how it's physically written, the answer to trying to read a queer lyric from Dickinson becomes even more difficult, unsurprisingly. Because when we try to reckon with its, with its materialist history, it de certainly destabilizes the assumptions that can be made about the poem when we try to read it as a lyric. Ultimately, the poem's addressee becomes far less certain, and we have even more possibilities as to who Dickinson may have addressed, who, who Dickinson may have addressed this poem to. Of course, while Dickinson could be allowing us to revel in the possibilities of who was the addressee, I pivot instead to exploring what those possibilities are instead of getting so caught up and hung up in who this poem could be addressed to. If there is one thing that can be held stable in queer and lyric discourse, their definitions are perpetually unstable. This is not to say that Dickinson would have been sensitive to literary terminologies such as lyric that we would, that we would reckon with now, especially with the advent of the lyric theory reader of about seven years ago. However, what I end this presentation on is a note to keep those possibilities open when we do keep reading Dickinson. Perhaps her best is fit for pearls is or is not a lyric poem, a queer poem, a queer lyric poem, 
a lyric that happens to be queer or any other permutation. However, the possibility of it being as such, either all at once or something else entirely, still remains. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Jane, for this very enriching presentation. I'm, I'm really sorry that I have to like rush you through like all these very condensed versions. Uh, but we still have some time for questions, so um, I would like to invite uh, our four speakers to yeah um, to be here to turn on your um, your uh, cameras and uh, we will open the, the first question is Jeff and then uh, Yikta. Uh, great. So, is it um, how should we should we invite Jeff first? Yeah, Jeff. Oh, yes, please, Jeffrey. Would Thank you like you to go much. ahead? Thank you very much. Briefly, I know time is 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 short, but a question for Jamie Fenton, please. Um, well, two observations and then a question. The two observations are that um, your reading of the poem reminded me of success is counted sweetest. The, the, the anticipation, the, the sound before death that's, that occurs in, in success is counted sweetest. No, the, um, the distant strains of triumph burst agonized and clear as the agonized being there is lying on the ground. The whizzing that you noted before the bullet enters is this, and hearing the sound of it, death arriving or something like that. I wonder if that might, uh, lead you in some direction. Secondly, the prosody of the poem that you study is seems anomalous in Dickinson, given that the first stanza is largely iambic pentameter. And I'd wonder if that might, I know these are difficult questions, so if they're not helpful, just, we could just forget about them. Or, but my question is, how does onomatopoeia work in Dickinson? The whizzing there is such an amazing word. I mean, and you focus on the whizzing, and where it comes from, and you go to the, the Springfield Republican and so on. If you had any thought, if you thought at all on how onomatopoeia works in Dickinson, I would be grateful to hear you. Great. Um, thank you very much for those wonderful questions. Um, yeah, there is a really uh, interesting link to success. Um, and I think also um, I heard a fly buzz when I died in that regard, in that sound seems to be the last thing that happens before death. Um, and it might be a way of um, imagining into that space uh, beyond death where Dickinson so often places herself where there seems to be some way of her observing, but no way of her sending anything back, or getting into a conversation. So it seems to be these, these one way sounds um, that land on the ear and then get a bit lost. But that, that was a really good link, thank you. Um, onomatopoeia, yes. Um, I'm, so my, um, my project in general um, is quite um, skeptical about poems making sounds. Um, especially in Dickinson, who seems to be so kind of uh, tied to the page. Um, I'm kind of trying to work out what poems can do if we don't allow that they make noise. But in that case, we still have things like um, Zs, um, maybe not onomatopoeic, but at least a strange letter. Um, they, they always stand out. And um, perhaps Whizzing and Fraser, the, the Zs in the middle of both those words, um, are a kind of visual onomatopoeia, to use a horrible um, oxymoron. Um, but yeah, um, it's, it's something certainly I'm thinking about, um, to the extent Dickinson thought that a poem could make sound come off the page. Um, and I haven't worked out quite to what extent she thought that was possible. But thank you for those, those excellent observations. Thank you, I'm sorry to, thank you very much. Um, great, thank you. Uh, Jit Ka, do you have a question you'd like to share? Uh, yes, I have a question for Maria. And uh, about the uh, hyper object, um, it's a term I've never heard of before. And so how does it like translate to Dickinson's poetry? Is it like objects or concepts that are like beyond time and space or um, how do you understand it? <laughs> thank you. Well, if you think in terms of, of human mortality, thank you so much. And I, I enjoyed the previous question as well. I keep thinking, I just wanna go back to what Jamie was saying. Can it, um, in, uh, I felt the funeral in my brain, she says, in being but an ear. I don't know. You know, when people talk, all you can hear is like other lines from other poems. But your question about hyper objects is about, you know, human mortality. We're really limited in terms of how much we can conceive. So, for instance, when people say, oh, this rock is so many million years old, we really can't understand it. And that 
I think Morton, when he wrote the book and published it in 2015, he was trying to talk about climate change, that it seems as though there is a, a conceptual problem, probably the same thing with coronavirus. We don't really understand it. And in some ways that was preventing from people acting upon it. And then the more you think it like styrofoam, like when people try to say like little plastic things are going to last. So that it's, it's, we try to understand it, we have these constructs for it, but they're really beyond a deep understanding. And so I think it was something he had coined in one word, one book, and then he ended up writing an entire book on it. But it's something that becomes very applicable to the world we live in now with globalization, where we're constantly stressed upon us to think in these scales. And I'm noticing even, if you look at children's books, how much is from a planetary perspective? If you go to like a, the children's part of a bookstore, I was thinking, I don't even know if I could comprehend that as a child, how much is like given to them on this huge time and space scale. And so I think Dickinson, someone who swims very effortlessly through those kind of time scales, might be more difficult for us as readers. So that's how I was trying to bring those two into conversation. Thank you, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I see a comment from Ivy uh, talking about a, a poem discussing Amanda's lecture, a classic major, one of my students, a classics major, reads this poem as a description of Medusa. I wonder if Amanda wants to say something about it? Um, I, <laughs> I haven't thought much about um, Medusa in relationship to the poem, but I think that that's um, a lovely reading, especially since there's the section of the poem where she talks about having um, marble actually rot inside of her veins. Um, she says, who wrought Carrara in me? And she thinks of herself as sort of like in relationship to a, a marble sculpture. Um, yeah, I think that's a very apt um, reference. That's also, it's also a concept that Dickinson struggles with throughout her poetry, this idea of the human body becoming um, mineral or becoming um, like, like uh, a rock. It's her, that seems to be her image of death and, and as opposed to say like Whitman's image of death, which is about decomposition and then the reconstitution of the body in leaves of grass. For Dickinson, it's very much about the consolidation of the body into marble. So yeah, certainly an interesting reference. Great, thanks. Now we have a question from Tris, uh, Tracy to Jane. Tracy, would you like to uh, talk about your question? Yes, I kept listening to that last talk about um, queer lyric, and I thought he was referring to one specific poem, but he never told us what poem he was referring to. Thank you. Uh, her breast is fit for pearls. I'm sorry? Uh, her breast is fit for pearls. What, what Franklin number is that? Uh, give me a second. It might, it might be a good idea to... Um, Type that uh, title in chat along with the number. That would be helpful, probably. Thank you. Yeah, hold good on. idea. Hold on, hold on just a second. I found the Franklin number. It's 121. Th thank you. Of course. Um, great. It looks like we have a, a very interesting and engaging question, uh, a discussion here. And personally, I, I have a quick question for all of you, four wonderful speakers, because um, I've been thinking about the issue of uh, disaster and um, your papers, one way or another, uh, talks about how to address the issue of calamities or how to open up possibilities when you are potentially um, like in the state of uh, stasis or, um, well, heteronormative uh, normative, uh, um, society. So I wonder if each of you would like to say something about how um, you feel like how your, your paper can in a way uh, illuminate how Dickinson might be, uh, Dickinson's poems might be relevant in our, in our experience of, uh, trauma or uh, disaster 
um, and or or if you you do you feel like your ideas change after the whole COVID nineteen disaster just happened? Because I I know that our panel was organized way before the whole situation, yeah. right? So I wonder if you have some some thoughts about it. Um, uh, please feel free to share your ideas. Yeah, I'll dive in quickly if that's all right. Um, yeah, so I, I did come up with uh, a lot of this research long before this all kicked off and then I only went back to it afterwards and it's turned from what was quite a kind of like this specific kind of techie way into certain objects that civil war that uh, objects of the civil war that Dickinson um, was aware of and wrote about into how those objects fit into her entire scheme of um, relating to people away at, away at war and trying to get a handle on them. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's, it's very much um, changed the direction of my thinking and it's now become a piece more about um, voice and how she might uh, hear or witness uh, the voices of Civil War soldiers as well as just the kind of the bits and bobs, the kind of more usual Dickinson stuff um, that we're used to writing about. So yes, definitely changed my thinking. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. Um, can I, I'll weigh in. Yes, please. Uh, Okay, so um, it was published quite a while ago, but Gary Lee Stoneham's book on Dickinson and the Sublime continues to stay with me. And his argument was that there's that moment in the sublime where you're confronted with it, but where you kind of sublimate that fear and almost feel part of the sublime. Stoneham had argued that she actually arrests it at that moment. She never sublimates it and kind of appropriates it into her identity. So she's always at that pause moment of, the confrontation with something much larger than the self, maybe even traumatic. And so yesterday when people were looking at after great pain, the word that struck me was the second to last line was something along the lines of as freezing persons recollect. And so what she does there simultaneous is the person's in the process of being frozen, but already recollecting, you know, trying to piece it together what's actually happening. And what's very useful about Dickinson then is not about the kind of the after the trauma when someone tries to, well, some of her poems are, but the idea of what happens when you are in the middle of some kind of pain or trauma or catastrophe, she tries to give you some ground in the middle of it. And most of our discourse about trauma is about after. Yeah, just to echo what Maria just said, which is, I think, uh, lovely way of summarizing um, Dickinson's approach to, to disaster, but also how to sort of grapple with the wake of disasters or being in the middle of a disaster and in, in the middle of trauma. It seems like so much of her poetry is about grappling with that problem, with like analyzing the various states of being in the aftermath of a traumatic event. Um, I think in my own research, I mean, that has featured into my own research in the sense that um, it seems to me that these, that those, those states of being sort of like traumatized and depressed or being alive and vivacious are very much, um, for Dickinson, are very much associated with different temperatures, that being depressed is a kind of freezing, is a, is a kind of coldness, a kind of um, congealing of, of the body and the emotional state, whereas um, being hot is, is, is vi is vitality for her it's the caper is is the caper part is having an aptitude for bird um and it seems like um something about for me um i dropped my brain as a poem itself is very much a consideration of how to continue to survive in the face of severe dejection um, while having some kind of hope that's maybe not like um, Pollyanna-ish, but some kind of hope for a future that there will be change, that things will continue to move, even if we can't see the, um, the stretch of time that it will take. Um, there's something to me that's like, that's oddly hopeful about that, even though I don't always think of Dickinson as the poet of hope, but yeah. So a little bit. So, I, I, I my po my paper didn't really quite touch on disaster because I guess for this uh, I could, I've 
I thought about the bulk of my of my paper before the whole the COVID disaster happened. So a lot of what I've been sort of exposed to Dickinson's poet. So a lot of how I've been exposed to Dickinson's poetry is sort of being exposed to it as possibility because one of my favorite poems from her is. Uh, I dwell on possibility. I'm forgetting the Franklin number because I haven't really um, read, I haven't really explored Dickinson that leap in quite a while. But for me, it is difficult to see her as a, as a, po as, as a poet who holds sort of, sort, of, sort of piggybacking from what Amanda was saying. But I think for me, what is sort of comfort, what is sort of a strange comfort looking at Dickinson's poetry in the time of disaster is precisely, because, is precisely that it's sort of, it's uh, it's that sort of active grappling that she too is also grappling in the same like she's grappling with disaster in a sort of similar way that we are so in a sense it's almost to put in a very to put in a very it, it's a put in a very cliche it's almost kind of like reading a, reading a kindred soul a more elegant version a, a more elegant phrasing of that will come to mind but that's sort of like how i've been sort of processing this panel and processing how Dickinson reckons with disaster, that in, in, in many ways it's, it's almost akin to, like it, it's almost realizing just how much of that grappling is both unfamiliar and familiar to us, if that makes any sense. And her insistence on possibility, I think that's true. Yes. Yeah, she's always looking for possibility. I think that's part of like the, um, that's a part of why she doesn't get, why she doesn't sublimate the fear of the sublime because it actually creates more possibility, poetic possibility for her. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And I feel like the discussion sort of teased up the bit where you, you don't have time to talk about which you manifest so well in your abstract. So I appreciate your efforts and um, your great patience. And I'm really happy to finally see all of you here in person. I wonder, because we're running out of time, I wonder if there is any final burning question or suggestions, because we have a lot of uh, great uh, chat discussions here as well. And I could see how the kind of creative energy is being um, oozing slowly but also explosive, quoting another in the last reading. Um, so any thoughts or questions or suggestions? Um, thank you. Uh, if not, then should we uh, now uh, wrap it up and, and thank you all for uh, this wonderful uh, panel. And I hope that you will be able to uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And if you're the, this is your first time or the second time you remain, uh, then or many other times, then um, I'm, I'm sure I'll be uh, seeing all of you again uh, uh, in the near future. And um, thank you. And please join me to give them uh, some virtual claps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Then I will see you in the, um, the next panel, which will begin at 11. 20 so you will still have around uh, time, 10 20 minutes uh, coffee break and have a lovely morning afternoon or evening it's uh, 11 o'clock here uh, almost midnight so for me <laughs> so yeah <laughs> i enjoyed it i feel like i can i have a i'm going to have a, a good night tonight thank you all um goodbye <laughs>